I'm live. All right. Good morning. I, uh, again, with the technical difficulties, we're trying to get them ironed out, but I uh, welcome all of you at home that are, are going to uh, be here for this Bible study. Uh, we've been working on Amos now for a number of weeks, and we've worked our way up to uh, chapter 4, Amos chapter 4. And this is the second message uh, uh, that's coming, coming from Amos. Uh, the prophet Amos, uh, in this second message, he names uh, three sins uh, that were grieving the Lord and uh, ruining the kingdom of Israel. And these were luxury, hypocrisy, and obst uh, obstinacy. They had... Uh, the people of Israel, they had the wrong values, their religious revival was a sham, and they had refused to listen to the warnings that God had given them. So starting in chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and three, one three, it says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with Israel, take you away with beet hooks, and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to the harmon, declares the Lord. So, these luxuries, most of these luxuries and many of the so-called comforts of life, um, oh, let me start over. <laughs> okay. Um, Henry David Thoreau wrote in his classic, uh, book, Wal uh, uh, classic book, Waldron, this quote, Most of the luxuries and many of the so-called comforts of life are not, on uh, are not only not indispensable, but positive hindrances to the elevation of mankind. And his friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, wrote in his own journal, Our expense is almost all for uh, comf comfort, comforty. For uh, it is for cake that we all run in debt. So let's let's seek to answer some of the questions about luxury. What is luxury? The word comes from a Latin word that means excessive. It originally referred to plants that grow abundantly, or in our English language, luxurious. But then it came to refer to people who have an abundance of money, or an abundance of time, or abundance of comfort, which they use for themselves as they live in aimless leisure. Whenever you are offered deluxe service, that's the same Latin word, service above and beyond what you really need. And it, it isn't a sin to be rich or to have the comforts of life if this is God's will for you. Abraham and, and David uh, were wealthy men, yet they used what they had for God's glory. In the eyes of uh, people in the third world, most of the citizens of the western world, including even our poor, in their sight, are very wealthy. The western world considers necessities are luxuries to the citizens of other nations. Things like you know, thermostatically controlled uh, heat and air conditioning and refrigerators and automobiles and cell phones and TVs and medical care and abundantly available electricity and fuel. They don't have a lot of these things in the third world. Luxury doesn't mean owning abundant possessions, 
so much as allowing possessions to own us. To live in luxury is to use what we have only for our own enjoyment and to ignore the needs of others. It means irresponsible in the way we use our wealth, wasting it on futile pleasures instead of using it for the good of others and the glory of God. There's a sign in an exclusive clothing store reads, if you must ask the price of our garments, you can't afford them. People who live in luxury don't bother to ask the prices. They don't care how much they spend so long as they get what they want. So who was committing this sin? Right in verse 1 in chapter 4, it says, Here the, uh, it says the, um, you, he says, You cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria. Amos addressed the wives of the wealthy leaders of the land. People had gotten rich by ruthlessly and, and, willing, uh, and illegally robbing others. These uh, society women uh, lounged around all day drinking wine and telling their husbands what to do. What do you think would happen today if uh, a preacher gets up here in front and called the women in the congregation cows? I think he'd be looking for a new job. So, so why? So, why did Amos, the farmer, use this image? Not because these women were, were overweight and looked like cows, but because their sins were fattening themselves up for the coming slaughter. Both they and their husbands were living in luxury, while the poor of the land were suffering because these same men had exploited them and robbed them of money and land. What will happen to them? What do farmers eventually do when, with cattle that have been fattened up? They lead them away to be killed and butchered. Amos described what would happen when the Assyrians invaded Israel, how they would capture these women and treat them like cattle. The Assyrian practice was to put hooks in the noses or lips, lower lips of their prisoners, attach ropes, and lead them away like animals, either to captivity or to death. This is what the enemy would do to the wealthy matrons Amos was addressing in this message. But note that their posterity would also be involved in this judgment. Verse 2 goes on, it says, The Lord God, uh, God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. These wealthy women no, day, no doubt wanted the best for their children, but by their selfish, selfish priorities and their sinful example, they were giving their children the very worst. Their posterity had everything but a knowledge of the Lord. So they too would be led off like animals to the slaughter. The wealthy, younger generation in Israel had everything money could buy, but they didn't have the things that money can't buy, the things of the Lord that make life worthwhile. The industrial magnate uh, Andrew Carnegie said, Surplus wealth is a sacred trust which its possessor is bound to administer in his lifetime for the good of the community. If we turn over to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, uh, Paul writes, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. 
Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may uh, take hold of that which is life indeed. And in Paul, uh, in Acts 20, uh, quotes Jesus and says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Verse 4, it continues. We talk about, we're going to talk about hypocrisy now, starting at verse uh, 4 and 5. Enter Bethel, the transgress in Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from, the, from that which is leavened. No, uh, and proclaim free will offering, free will offerings. Make, make them known, for so you, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord of God. So the prophet used uh, kind of a holy irony here when he spoke these words. For he later instructed them over in, when we get over in chapter 5, he instructed them to do just the opposite. In 5.5, 5, he says, But do not resort to Bethel, and do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba. Uh, Gil, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. So it's kind of like today if somebody told you to, uh, sure, uh, go ahead and attend church, but by attending, you're only sinning more. Or go visit, uh, uh, go to a Bible um, conference, and, and by doing so, you'll be transgressing more. Your heart isn't serious but about knowing God or doing his will. It's all just placating. It's the popular thing to do, so you do it. Bethel was a special place to the Jewish people because of its associations with Abraham. And if you go uh, in, in some of these uh, with Abraham, if you'll go back to Genesis 12, 8. It says, Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And then in uh, Genesis 13, 3, he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. And uh, it was an important place for Jacob And if you go over to Genesis 28, um, uh, in verses uh, 10 through 22, but in 18 and 19 specifically, um, it says, So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured it oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Lose. Uh, at one time, the ark was kept at Bethel, and if you in the Judges talks about that. Um, Judges twenty uh, verses uh, eighteen through twenty-eight, but specifically we'll look at verse twenty-seven. Um, the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days, meaning in Bethel. But in Amos's day, it was the site of the king's chapel, where Amaziah, the priest, served. Uh, Gilgal 
was also important to Israel because that's where Joshua and the people camped when they first entered the promised land in Joshua 4 and verses 19 and 20 and again in chapter 5 talks about. And Gilgal is also where Saul was made king of Israel in 1 Samuel 11:15. Unfortunately, both of these places had become shrines where the people worshipped pagan gods while claiming to worship the Lord. On the surface, it looked like uh, it looked as if Israel was experiencing a religious revival. Crowds of people were flocking to the holy places. And Amos, uh, uh, as it's talked about there in Amos 5.5, 5, bringing their sacrifices and tithes, and even singing songs of praise to the Lord. They offered sacrifices more frequently than the law required, as if to prove how spiritual they were. But their gifts and songs didn't impress the Lord. For he saw that, uh, what was in their hearts, and the sin in their hearts made their sacrifices unacceptable. To begin with, their, their sacrifices were unclean, like offering leaven on the altar, which was forbidden by God in Leviticus. God doesn't want the sacrifices of bulls and goats. He wants the obedience of our hearts. In uh, 1 Samuel um, 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed them, uh, and to to heed than the fat of rams. Um, Psalms fifty. I do not reprove you of your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall make no young bull out of your house nor male goats out of your folds. <laughs> okay. Here we go. In Psalms uh, 51. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are, broken, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Again, and then in Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 11 through 17 talks about this same issue. In Hosea 6.6 6, and Micah 6 verses 6 through 8, these all have the same um, uh, references that were just talked about here. And in Mark 12, 28 through uh, 34, but down in, uh, uh, down near the bottom where I got it underlined there, is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So this is repeated a lot, talked a lot about it, that uh, the sacrifices aren't what it is, it's what's in your heart. If the heart isn't right with God, the sacrifice means nothing. Furthermore, they were proud of what they were doing and made sure everybody knew how generous they were to the Lord. They bragged about their free will offerings, which were purely voluntary, and they boasted to one another of their sacrifices. It wasn't the Lord who got the glory here. If you Look at Matthew 6, 1 um, through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored uh, by men. 
Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The people of Israel loved going to their religious meetings, but they didn't love uh, the God they claimed to worship. Making a pilgrimage to Bethel or Gilgal was the popular thing to do in that day, and everybody wanted to keep up with the crowd. There was no confession of sin, no brokenness, uh, brokenness before the Lord, but only a religious event that made the participants feel good. The whole system was corrupt. The people were sinning when they thought they were serving God. And we see this today in today's church. We, it's, sometimes it's obvious. It's very easy to, for us to maybe to join a large, uh, uh, happy religious crowd, enthusiastically singing rousing songs and waving your arms around and, and put money in the offering plate and yet not be changed in our hearts. The test of a spiritual experience is not, do I feel good or did we have a big crowd and a good time? The real test is, do I know God better than I am, and I am more like Jesus Christ? The people in Amos' day didn't return home determined to help the poor, or to feed the hungry, or to care for the widows and orphans. They went home with the same selfish hearts that they had when they left because their worship was only an empty ritual. Uh, let's see. I had that one. Any religious revival that doesn't alter the priorities of Christians and help solve the problems in a society isn't a revival at all. And it's interesting that, that Amos mentions music because that's an important part of the church, church's worship. However, what the Jews thought was beautiful music, God considered nothing but noise. Uh, and to get over, over to Amos uh, 5.23. Um, uh, it says, Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. You know, people today will go to, um, will pay you know, large amounts of money for tickets to go to uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, concerts. That's what, that's what I was looking for. I got lost in my notes here. Christian concerts. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll spend a lot of money to do that, yet they won't attend a free Bible study or a Bible conference in their own church. Christian music is a big business. Have you ever wondered how much of it really glorifies the Lord? What we think is music may be nothing but noise to the Lord. Amos has dealt with two of the three sins of the Lord, told him to condemn luxury and hypocrisy. And now, in chapters in verses 6 through 13, he's going to deal with the third uh, obstinacy. God's people were rebellious and hard-hearted, refusing to obey the Lord. So picking up in, chapter, or in verse uh, 6. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. 
Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on one and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees, yet you have not, not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you. Prepare to meet, you, meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Five times in this passage, Amos says to the people, Yet you have not returned to me. In 4, 6, 8, 9, verse 10 and 11. The people of Israel experienced God's discipline, but they wouldn't submit to his will. And yet, they continued practicing their hypocritical religion. Matthew 7, 21. Um, says, not... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. God's covenant with the Jews clearly stated that he would bless them if they obeyed his law and would discipline them if they disobeyed. And this is all covered in Deuteronomy in chapters 27 through 29. And God set before them, um, God set before them life and death, blessing and cursing, and he urged them to choose life. And Let's see, uh, choose life. So this is, uh, oh, 30, okay. I thought I made that big so I could see it. Um, but what I got set, uh, underlined there, set before you life and death and blessing and, the cur uh, blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live. Unfortunately, they spurned his love, rejected his warnings, and chose death. Consider some of the dis disciplines that God sent to Israel to bring his people back to himself. First, we had famine in verse 6. This uh, cleanness of teeth simply means the people had no food to eat. 
so their teeth didn't get dirty. Um, verse 6, I wanted to see something here. Some, um, some uh, Bible versions may have, uh, like the NIV, might say empty stomachs. Is that, does anybody have NIV? It says empty stomachs. But, uh, but the, and most of the other ones say cleanness of teeth, which means that because they weren't eating. God's covenant promised bumper crops if people just obeyed the Lord. But famine if they disobeyed. And we find that again in, in Leviticus in, in chapter 26 and verses 27 through 31. And in Deuteronomy again talks about the same, this same concept. When farmers can't grow cop, crops, food is scarce. Food prices go up and people suffer and die. And so you would think that this would, uh, would move people to confess their sins and return to God. But Israel did not return to God. And then verse chapters, or verses 7 and 8 talks about drought. Instead of, sending a, instead of sending a general drought over the entire kingdom, God withheld the rain in different places from time to time, thus proving that he was in control. This remarkable demonstration of God's sovereign power should have reminded those Jews of what the covenant said about the promised rains. Uh, In Leviticus um, 26, and 18 through 20, and what I've got highlighted there or underlined, your sky like iron and your earth like bronze, your strength will be uh, spent uselessly for your land will not yield its produce, and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. Um, Deuteronomy, uh, again, uh, he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield his, its fruit. Rain uh, in the Verse 24, uh, rain of your land, powder and dust. It talks about the, the lack of rain there. So, but they paid no heed. Uh, in verse 9, the discrep- dis- uh, they talk about the destruction of crops. Even when, God, even when God did allow them to grow fruits and vegetables, they weren't grateful. So he destroyed the crops with blight and mildew, and locusts. Once again, God was being true to his covenant warnings. Um, in Deuteronomy, he talks about the locusts will come, and the worms will devour them, and uh, for your olives will not drop off, the cricket shall possess. So here's all these warnings of things that happen, or things that happen in Deuteronomy. When God, uh, if you didn't follow his covenant, those are the warnings. So the, nation, so the nation should not have been surprised. Israel should not have been surprised. They knew this. It was part of their history. And the uh, first part of uh, verse 10, it talks about sickness. One of God's promises was that his people would not experience the dreadful disease they saw in Egypt if they were faithful to obey his law. Exodus 15, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. But if they rebelled against him, they would suffer all of these diseases, uh, all the diseases of Egypt. Leviticus um, 26 um, uh, where I got underlined there, I will send pestilence among you. Um, so he gives these, these warnings. These warnings are all through uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, uh, or 20, 28. Uh, he talks about pestilence clinging to you until he has consumed you, and, and the smite, and, and the Lord will smite you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and blight and with mildew. And so it goes on and on. Uh, again, in Deuteronomy, um, talks about, uh, about the boils and the tumors and the scabs and the madness and blindness and... Uh, uh, and the, uh, only the oppressed will be uh, oppressed and robbed. And so we have all these. Uh, did that change? Yeah. Uh, you will strike, uh, uh, the Lord will strike you on the knees and the legs with sores and boils. And, and as you go on and on and read, the, especially where I got these underlined, all these things that God said he's going to do if you don't obey him. But. So God is going to keep his word. Sometimes it takes a long time, but he's going to take, he's going to, he's going to uh, uh, enslave these Israels for, break, for, not, for, for not following his commandments. And they also defeat in war in the second half of verse 10. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and shall flee before you seven ways. What a promise for a small nation surrounded by huge empires. But the promise would be fulfilled only if the people were faithful to the Lord. If they disobeyed, they would be humiliated and defeated before their enemies. And again, it's talk that those same things are talked about in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So terrible would be their defeat that the dead bodies in the camps would not be given decent burial, but would lie there and rot. God kept his promise. The Assyrians conquered Israel, and the Babylonians took Judah into captivity. And in verse 11, it goes on with some catastrophes. We aren't sure just what this calamity was, and perhaps it was that earthquake that Lee talked about back in Amos 1.1, or it may have been the devastating invasion of the army. In uh, Kings, it says, in those days, the Lord began to cut off portions from, the, from Israel, and Hazel defeated them throughout the territory of Israel, from the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, and the Reubenites, and the Manassehites. From Acre, which is by the valley of Aron, even Gilead and Bashan. So, um, I lost my place. Okay, okay. So, but whatever it was, whatever it was, one of these, whether it was the earthquake or this uh, being defeated around the outer edges, or the um, uh, these things. Whatever it was, it was hard to be something terrible for the Lord to compare it to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The image of a stick pulled out of a fire suggests that the Lord intervened and saved them at the last minute. They had been burned but not consumed. If so, then their ingratitude and hardness of heart was even more wicked. And then verses 12 and 13 was the ultimate judgment. The kingdom of Israel had experienced famine, drought, blight, plagues, wars, and devastating catastrophes as God had tried to speak to his people and bring them to repentance. No matter what discipline he sent, they would not return to him. What more could he do? He could come himself and deal with them. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel, as it says in verse 12. It was not a call to repentance, but an announcement that it was too late to repent. The Lord of hosts himself would come with the Assyrian hordes 
and take the people away like cattle being led to slaughter. In chapter 5, verse 17 says, And in all the vineyards there is wailing, wailing, because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Amos ended his message with a doxology of praise to the Lord. 413. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes the dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. When a servant of God praises the Lord in the face of impending calamity, it shows he's a person of great faith. In this doxology, he reminds us that our God is the creator who can do anything, including making the earth out of nothing. He can turn dawn into darkness. He can tread upon the mountains and nobody can hinder him. He is also the omniscient God who knows what we are thinking. Uh, That's not what I wanted. Okay. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have stretched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my laying down and are intimately, thank you, acquitted with with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and laid your hand before me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. There is nothing, thus there's nothing we can hide from, uh, hide from him. He is the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of heaven and earth. But are God's people any more prepared today. That concludes four. I got a few people here. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Because it's yes, no? Well, yeah, just commenting on I'm gonna try to speak up so people at home can hear as well. I I don't know if you mentioned this verse um, earlier in your class. Um, and that's, that's really the point. And where was, where was that you were reading yeah, from? Deuteronomy 28, 47. Okay, I, I did 49 through 58. Oh, no, I didn't read that. I take that back. I didn't. That wasn't on the slide. Okay. Let's see, 28. Uh, I didn't. Sorry. No, no. It's okay, a, yeah. Good, good point. Good point. Okay, next week, uh, chapter... We're going to chapter 5, and I believe Lee is up for chapter 5. Let me look here. Yes, Lee will be teaching chapter 5. So thank you for your patience. Um, That's it.